Sarah Height. Um, I'm one of the co-curators of the exhibition, and I work at the museum as the manager of programs and fellowships at the Lender Institute for American Art. Um, we wanted to make sure that um, we dedicated at least one panel today to hearing from some of the amazing artists that we worked with um, in the show in different ways. And we thought for this first uh, conversation among the group that we would talk about representation, both in the sense of um, the history of non-Native artists and Anglo-American artists depicting uh, Native people and Native culture, and also get into self-representation and the way that contemporary Native artists today are thinking about um, representation more broadly. And I think before we get into the first questions, maybe if everyone just wants to go through really quickly and um, just introduce themselves and your name, um, maybe what you did for the for the project, just so everybody kind of knows who everyone is. Do you want to start us off, Jason? Sure. Uh, good morning, Sayu Chamu. Now I'm coping. Now it's all how it's it all. I'm just saying, I'm not saying much. Good evening or good evening or morning, everyone. My time is is <laughs> off West Coast time, two two hours ahead. So, uh, good afternoon, good day. Uh, I'm Jason Garcia, <laughs> Okup In is my Tewa name, uh, Turtle Mountain, and uh, I'm from the Pueblo of Santa Clara, uh, New Mexico, which is about 30 miles north of Santa Fe, one of six Tewa Pueblos uh, in northern New Mexico. I am a uh, potter, ceramicist, printmaker, um, also a graduate of University of New Mexico and also University of Wisconsin. Um, you know, happy to be here, one of the participating artists. Uh, in the show, and uh, you know, very privileged to work with you know everybody here that's on stage. You know, prior to this, uh, working with them, and then also uh, to the other Pueblo people here in the audience as well too. So, again, thank you very much, Kudo. Let's go first. All right. Hi, my name is Virgil Ortiz. I'm from Cochiti Pueblo. Uh, I'm a potter, and I do a lot of other mediums, but pottery is my uh, the main. Um, artwork that I do and uh, what I did for this project was to help design uh, the exhibition. I have one piece in it and thanks for having us here. Uh, I'm Sarah Sockbeeson. I'm Penobscot uh, ash and sweetgrass basket maker artist. Um, served on the advisory panel and uh, had the opportunity to make a piece for exhibition um, that the museum acquired. Hello, my name is Jill Alberg Yo. Oh, first I want to thank Dr. and Governor Sweena, Governor Bio, thank you so much for your words and your prayer. Thank you. Um, my name is Jill Alberg Yo. I'm a co curator along with Sierra Height and Juan Lucera on, and Virgil mm -hmm. um, on this project, and it has truly been an honor to, to be a part of this important exhibition. Hello, everybody. I'm Juan Lucero. I was one of the co-curators along with Jill and Sierra, and um, I'm very happy to be here, very happy to be with all the artists that are here today. I, it's always been a goal of mine to bring Pueblo people wherever I go, so wherever I go, <laughs> I'll probably drag you all along with me, no matter where I go. we got to start the next revolt some point, so I'm really excited to start it here, lay the groundwork. Um, but I'm really happy. And before we get too far ahead, I really want to uplift Sierra. Mm, um, yes. And all yes. the work she does for us. And yes. she does for us. And just bringing my family out here, uh, I'm so appreciative of that. And oh. helping us find a babysitter and all that work. <laughs> really yes. It's been so awesome. And just Native women in leadership roles needs to happen more. It really needs to happen all across the country, especially in the museum field. So I'm really appreciative of the work that you have done for this at Sierra. Thanks, Juan. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Yes. 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 Also, yeah, shout out to Gracie and your two kids for making the flight. It's not a small feat to get to Maine, so. So you want to start? First question. Yeah, I'd love to start. Okay. First question. What would you like to see museums doing with their holdings of Euro-American art that depict Native people and places? 
Just an easy question to kick you all off. <laughs> you'd like to see? We're looking at you. Um, <laughs> I, I guess I can say something. Um, <laughs> especially when it comes to um, pieces um, that may like reference Native people, that may have like a romanticized sort of um, depiction. I'm thinking about um, also the time period of which it was from. And in particular, I have often um, experienced art um, as a Native person, looking at it and seeing it um, in you know many different contexts. But I always felt like there was um, a feeling that I got when I would come into a situation where um, my people, I felt as if my people were being depicted in a certain way and it might have either been like thematic or um, a way in which maybe wasn't 100% like historically accurate. Mm -hmm. And so in those sort of situations, um, there's always a sense of um, discomfort, awkward, aw awkward kind of feeling, um, and just like confusion, I feel like. Um, and especially when it comes to this romanticized kind of um, depiction or, um, showing Native people in a light that um, maybe isn't positive. It's um, an example of somebody else telling the story for Native people. And it also becomes uh, then in the mind of all the people that see that, um, that work. And so it becomes like a part of collective consciousness. And so it's, it's, I think it's really tricky because um, it's, it's who is willing, able, uh, to tell that story that really gets to, that gets the opportunity. And so I think um, when it comes to works that are already in institution, I think it um, comes down to like an opportunity to teach and to um, maybe allow some new voices to come in and um, talk about the ways in which those depictions affect them or um, have consequences for being out there into the world circulating and becoming part of the collective consciousness. And I, w I should backtrack and um, I should have asked you first, can you talk a little about, a bit about your fantastic work in, in this show? <laughs> um, okay, so you want me to jump right into <laughs> the basket piece? Yeah, well, yeah, well I think people would love to hear okay. about your fantastic work. Okay. Uh, where do I start? <laughs> Wherever you want. Okay. Um, well, I think the biggest thing that a lot of people are unaware of would be that that piece is made um, like 100% of non-traditional materials. <laughs> so I grew up um, knowing that within my family, um, I come from a long, long line of basket makers, um, specifically ash and sweetgrass. And so... Um, I've always had a connection with um, those materials, and they mean a lot, mean a lot culturally. Um, they're sacred. Uh, sweetgrass is one of the four sacred medicines. Ash is a part of our creation story. And so as, we, um, as the earth is becoming more and more effective, uh, affected by you know, people's um, interactions with it, um, we lose uh, sources of material or our materials are becoming uh, damaged, scarce, it's being affected by uh, the way in which it grows and how often we are able to access it. Um, so, you know, between like development and all these different things that um, disconnect us from access to those materials, um, which also includes um, invasive species that can harm um, specifically the ash. And so along those lines of thinking um, how we may not always have um, our resources, uh, we may not have access to be able to work with those, I started to think about um, what we could potentially do to um, not only like be resourceful, but also uh, to carry on the techniques mm -hmm. of the tradition and be able to still um, pass our knowledge to the next generation if we lost, um, lost our materials. 
And so I thought of um, just different ways that I could potentially experiment and play with new materials, uh, branch out of what I normally do. And um, I can go into uh, specifics at, a, at another time, but um, in terms of what I uh, ultimately chose to use for this piece was um, recycled materials because I really wanted to um, think about how we um, waste a lot of things and also um, thinking about what, what would have the least harmful impact to the uh, earth if I am to um, create this piece. And I thought um, not only can I potentially salvage things that would other be uh, considered waste or uh, discarded, um, I also thought about kind of cleaning up uh, the earth and ways that we can employ these different materials in new contexts and uh, reinvent what they are potentially, um, what they can be made into, I guess. Thank you. I'm curious, since we heard from Sarah, Jason, if you want to talk a little bit, because like Sarah, we commissioned a work for specifically for the show mm -hmm. and also with your work, Jason, that you contributed to the exhibition. That's also something that was made particularly um, for the event of the show. If you want to talk just a little bit about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I had uh, created uh, three different pieces for the exhibition. Uh, they're clay tiles. Uh, two are separate pieces. Uh, another one is a diptych that's on the uh, brochure on the uh, front cover there, uh, titled in Back in Time. <laughs> and, um, you know, as I kind of looked at the slides, you know, they're kind of revolving and kind of going fast. And, um, but uh, I created uh, three, or rather, yeah, three pieces for the exhibition. Um, I use uh, traditional materials, traditional techniques in all of my work. Uh, it's mineral pigments that's gathered from different areas of New Mexico, Arizona, and uh, Colorado, and then... Uh, you know, using traditional clays that have been got, gathered uh, near Santa Clara Pueblo, and then it's uh, traditionally uh, fired outdoors as well, too. Um, just some thoughts as far as looking at what the theme of the exhibition was, of thinking of the uh, Tao Society artists, uh, painters, and uh, their depictions of their um, daily life scenes of, of Taos Pueblo and surrounding Pueblos, and using uh, various Pueblo models uh, for the images. Uh, I do a work like that. I, I usually say that my work documents the ever-changing cultural landscape of Capo Winge, Santa Clara Pueblo. Um, the three pieces that I do have is, uh, there's a piece that I think is called like In Indian Priestess or Women Priestess. Mm -hmm. It's like two women mm -hmm. that are walking and it kind of mimics the uh, two, later, two ladies that are like the water carriers of, um, of Santa Clara, you know, carrying the water jars on their head, and then they're walking by the uh, Abanyu Travel Center, which is in uh, Santa Clara Pueblo, uh, on, on the lands there in the town, neighboring uh, border town of Espanola. And, you know, they're showing they're ga gathering the water, you know, at the local quote unquote watering hole. This is the other piece here, the uh, diptych back in time. And, uh, you know, the DeLorean's kind of like the time machine of Back to the Future. <laughs> And uh, showing the lady on the, um, on, I guess, this side, our right. And, uh, you know, kind of showing that in the past. And then the, the other image is, is her in the present day uh, with the telephone antennas and power lines and uh, uh, satellite dishes that also represent our patron saint of St. Clair of Assisi, who's the uh, patron saint of the blind and television as well, too. So I think it was just kind of depicting you know, our, our, what I see daily life, or, you know, with the buffalo uh, dancer, you know, holding the, um, uh, the sonic cup in her, in her hand as she's drinking, and then also taking a selfie as well, too. So you just, <laughs> just de depictions of, of life, and uh, maybe not as romanticized or, or stereotypical um, images that we sometimes see, you know, like the Tao Society. Uh, painters of, of wanting to depict something that's kind of like untouched or, or uh, removing certain uh, contemporary life uh, uh, items in, in, in the painting. So 
I, I think that's that pretty much kind of sums up the question in terms of what I, I created for for the exhibition, and and it's it's amazing exhibition as well. Just seeing all the various uh, artists, contemporary, historic. And then also the uh, Tao Society and materials are amazing. Like the Sarah's piece is, is crazy amazing. And I, I was blown away <laughs> by just looking at the materials and being like, wow. Um, <laughs> it's just amazing. So uh, everybody in the work is show is amazing and, and all inspirational for myself as well, too, as an mm -hmm. artist and as an individual, too, with the scholars and curators and everybody involved. Thank you. I'm kind of, it's um, striking me as you're talking, it's interesting hearing you talk about the ever-changing landscape, and mm -hmm. Sarah, you're also thinking about, the, in a different way, the changing landscape in the future, but one thing with both your work and Virgil's work that has struck me is um, using, um, like, sci-fi, or in your case, Virgil, or ideas of futurism and humor, like these different kind of strategies for approaching your work, and I'm wondering if either of you want to talk about that, how you think about that in terms of your practice. Sorry. I, I think it's like the reason I use the sci-fi aspect for, of it is just to attract the uh, attention of the younger viewer um, mm -hmm. and all the Pueblos and in general as well, um, because everybody's on their phone on Instagram, right, and Facebook <laughs> looking at, at different things. and if. Um, coming at it, because I'm not an academic person at all. Mm -hmm. Like I do all my education through art. Um, so I let the art speak for itself, but uh, to be able to communicate with that generation. I mean, I want to create fantastical images, superhero mm -hmm. images, uh, but then also when they're looking through the whole thing and they read what it's about, then all of a sudden they've learned a, a lesson in history. Mm -hmm. So it's just really trying to look at it in a way of when I was affected as a kid, um, seeing these uh, sci-fi movies. Um, not reinventing it, but just like adapting it to mm -hmm. our storyline. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, what, like for the first question that we had was, it's like this whole um, Colby Museum, what they did and like to install this show is just like really amazing how it, um, that's the answer I think, is to have like contemporary indigenous uh, voices along the, these paintings. Um, I think that's like the perfect answer to, to that question, mm -hmm. is just to give us a voice to be able to answer and to have a conversation with these pieces like that and it's really important to have it and like listening to Mr. Bio's um, presentation it just blew my mind like when he mentioned 130,000 pieces <laughs> it was like I was like shaking in my boots just to think about what what you've seen and then the work that you and Dr. Serena have been doing it's just like we thank you very much for leading this uh, reawakening or this um, enlightening people of what they see in museums. And I too had the shock when I also uh, go into different museums, their collections to um, not only to design the exhibition that I'm about to be a part of or um, just to like look at all of the collections that they do have and I, I've seen those pieces before too but they're also in the process of repatriation uh, to it so that's like, I mean, like the work you guys are doing is just like very important, thank you for doing that. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just like, then also like when you see historical pieces of um, uh, our uh, Coach de Pueblo's historic work um, that probably nobody have, has ever seen before. So the ones I go in there and I look at these pieces and how it connects and make sure everybody knows that is not me as a inventor of it. Like I'm just reviving what our people have done and following on that process and making sure that doesn't die out. But uh, to bring those pieces into the light and show the process of um, the historic, the present, and the future, how it's all going. And I, what I try to teach people that are interested in, in uh, people from Kochidi that are want to do the Kochidi pottery um, methods and materials is to show them exactly how, how I was taught and how it's done so it's not a secret, so they learn it. But also to encourage them, um, once they learn it th the traditional way, that, but also you know, don't hold back with using all types of materials like Sarah, or everybody that, or just like don't limit yourself and just like really follow what you want to do and give them the backbone to keep on doing it. Can I ask a question on? Um, kind of following in lines with what you guys are talking about as far as representation in museums. I think one of the things that I've 
learn and I always talk about is visiting museums as a kid, I always kind of found myself misplaced, even in our own cultural centers. Mm -hmm. As like Ryan said earlier, a lot of them are founded on those same museum practices and standards of like ethnography and depicting native peoples in the past. And one of the things that really stands out with all of your works is that it's through your eyes, it's through your perspective, and I really appreciate that. I think, is it a, is it a conscious effort on your guys' part to create works that speak from, um, I guess, to speak from your own perspective right now, or is it the clay that, or the materials that are speaking through you? And I think that's an important part of the process is that I, uh, for when, from when I create, I, I don't do it very often, but it's not me that's really doing the thinking, I don't think. It's the clay or it's the materials that I'm using that mm -hmm. often kind of speaks to that. And I, I, I think that'd be great to hear from all of you to kind of talk about that. Is that the, is it the materials that are speaking through you or do you have an idea before you go into creating these works? I can go. Um, <laughs> so I, I think that there's uh, two kind of ways I feel, because um, that's a good question. Um, so growing up, I didn't always have access to like my, um, like all the traditional knowledge involved in creating baskets. So um, even though my great grandmother was a basket maker, uh, her daughter, my grandmother, she didn't learn. And so I did an apprenticeship with, um, if, if people know uh, Teresa Secord, um, her uh, apprentice was Jennifer Neptune, and then I did an apprentice with uh, Jennifer, um, an apprenticeship. And so when I was uh, learning with her, um, she kind of showed me all the basics when it comes to processing the ash and uh, working with the materials and how, to, how it's like really important to master um, that preparation because that preparation is gonna determine like um, the eventual result of your final piece. And so through that process of um, preparing the material, I really, um, there was something that like came very naturally and I felt um, that it came quickly and it wasn't as if um, she had to teach me for um, a, like a long time. It wasn't like a ton of instruction. She would give me very basic um, kind of uh, overview, uh, introductions, and um, as soon as I picked up the material and started working with it, it just became like, it, it just came super natural and quick to me. And so um, I often like wonder if that is sort of like a DNA memory like coming through. Mm -hmm. And if, um, you know, there's something that just came naturally because of um, the lineage in my family, or if um, maybe I don't, I, I just question that a lot. Um, in terms of how that works. Um, but when it comes to like the materials of guiding the process or like what I'm going to create, I think it's a combination of one, looking at the materials and getting inspired and um, by those, uh, especially when it comes to the non-traditional materials because those oftentimes what I eventually will make will be dictated um, by how um, those materials kind of like cooperate. Um, <laughs> and for the piece that I did um, in the exhibit, I was almost trying to simulate ash and trying to look, um, kind of making the material act as if it were ash. Mm -hmm. But um, there were, not every material that I tested out worked. And so it became kind of um, almost like a science project in a lot of ways because there was a lot of trial and error and like, does this work, does this not work? But I was really trying to um, simulate the way that the ash feels, moves, the way it manipulates. Um, and I think that's part of what like guided how I uh, like came upon um, making that piece was um, allowing the materials to kind of guide uh, that process where I feel mm -hmm. as though when it comes to the ash, uh, I feel more um, in control of the ash in that I am able to manipulate it to my own kind of uh, imagination. Yeah. I think I learned at a young age that 
we can't control Clay, Jason. <laughs> like Clay, Clay, I got to accept that Clay was always going to kick my butt. <laughs> <laughs> just, just because, like, I mean, it is Earth Mother, right? And it's like realizing that at that age, you're like, okay, you think you're going to make something that you want to do, but it changes and it kind of guides you. So I, like, my parents taught me this is where you do your prayers when you're uh, creating it. So it's like always thought of it as art therapy and really it saved my life. 